So, to introduce my talk, I'm going to talk about some simple thoughts which, help, which might help in dealing with the science of consciousness. And the examples I'm producing are those which, which come from the change in what is, n what is known as consciousness in the, in the general public uh, and how one recovers from brain traumas of one kind or another. And I will add a few remarks about higher and lower states of consciousness. So what is consciousness? Conscious this question has been around for a very long time. I would like to uh, just refer you to Dr. M.G.K. Menon, who in 2004 at a, at a uh, seminar on mind and consciousness uh, simply asked that very question. What is consciousness? Consciousness, if we look at the cosmic consciousness that Jack Ellis has just been talking about, is something enormous. It's, and if we look at the way Professor um, Stuart Hameroff talked about consciousness and how it could, could be associated with the uh, superstring theory, it's something not only enormous but also small. It's very small. Uh, it, if we look at various other people's points of view, consciousness is just, in fact, one could say the whole universe or multi-universes are consciousness of, of themselves. We had a talk yesterday which related consciousness entirely to, to uh, information. Uh, and uh, there are all sorts of things that you could say. But I am going to use a very simple uh, form of, of definition for consciousness. Simply, consciousness is a state of the brain. Now, consciousness in humans would be a state of the human brain, and consciousness in rats, since we had a conversation earlier about uh, examining rat brains, would be a state of the rat brain. It's difficult to understand how consciousness under that definition can be associated with flowers because they don't have brains. But, uh, so therefore I'm eliminating from, from talk the idea of, of communication between plants and animals. But I do believe that almost every animal can be said to have at least some kind of consciousness. Whether one could argue that consciousness originated in the green algae, uh, which, from which all life on Earth gradually evolved, I don't know. And how it came about that consciousness appeared, I really do not know. But consciousness seems to be a part of every, every sentient being that has, or a possibly sentient being that has a brain. Now, this, tells, this says to me that consciousness is something, to be fully conscious then, one must have a fully functioning brain. But that can't be totally true because a damaged brain can be fully functional. And also, if one's dealing with the brain, maybe one ought to be dealing with the whole uh, nervous system, because after all, the brains, the, the nerves that, that communicate with the brain in my fingertips are, in fact, part of the, nerv of the whole nervous, nervous, what do I want to call it? I've forgotten the name. The nervous system of the, of the, of the, uh, of the human being. And certainly mine is not fully functional because I have some neuropathy in my fingers. And why do I have? Because years ago I had a stroke and I've never fully recovered the total use of my left hand, which is very annoying to me because I used to play a stringed instrument, the guitar, and I can't play it anymore because I can't move my fingers fast enough. Uh, but still, uh, in a very wide sense, damaged brains can be functional. Let me... Um, let me just go a little farther. In May of 2005, I had a stroke. It's nice to be able to refer, by the way, to one's own personal experiences in dealing with these things because when you have a stroke, if it's a, if it's a serious one, you do cease to be fully conscious. I had a stroke, and uh, I, I recall it very well. It was on the 1st of May. 
2005. And that day, I was out in my, uh, in my garden. I have, I have a substantial, well, depends what you mean by substantial. I have, a, a, I have about two and a half hectares of ground around my house. And, uh, and part of it is in grass and part of it is in trees. And that day, I was out during the afternoon. It was a beautiful day outside, rather like today. And uh, I was operating my chainsaw. Chainsaws are dangerous at the best of times. And I decided that it was getting on towards evening, so I put down the saw and I, walked, I went into the house to watch the news on television. And while watching the news, I suddenly realized that my feeling was strangely changing in my face. And, and so I, and, and uh, various uh, symptoms which I'd heard about for, for strokes were taking place, so I pulled my Blackberry from my pocket, just like this one, and uh, and I used it as a telephone, which I seldom do. And I hit the uh, speed call, and I got my son's house, and I said, "I think I'm having a stroke," and then hung up. And uh, and then I thought, well, this is no good because uh, they weren't answering the phone anyway because it was on an answering machine. So I tried to stand up, and at that point, I stepped. I stood in a vertical, got up from sitting, and suddenly realized that I had no left side at all. Right? I stood up using my right leg to get straight, straighten myself up, and then, of course, I had no balance and, and no, uh, and no uh, use of my right hand. Well, I had no idea that I actually had a left leg or a left arm, and uh, I didn't know quite what to do because I was trying to call the ambulance for myself. I live by myself fell to the ground, but I was fully aware of what was going on. I knew I was on the floor. I could, I could see out of my right eye quite well. And, uh, and then along, I discovered that my dog, I have a dog. It's not a small dog. It weighs about 40 kilograms. And uh, the dog was in the same room with me. And when I fell to the ground, my dog, uh, walked up to me and stood on me and started to um, lick my ear. It was, it was snuffling in my ear. I could lick it with my right ear so I could hear it. And uh, this dog, I'll show you a picture of her. There she is. She's not small. And uh, normally you would feel quite oppressed if an if a animal weighing 40 kilograms was standing on you. But I couldn't feel the weight. I could hear her, hear her nose snuffling. At my, uh, at my ear, and uh, she was upset. She was upset, and that in itself tells me that animals are conscious. And it gives me, if I look at this dog now, I still have her. She's about 10 years old. Um, and when I, when I go into my house, she comes to me, and she looks at me, and I can see that she is asking for affection. And when she's asking for affection, I know that, that she is a conscious being, right? She also knows very well that if I reach onto one particular container in my house, there will be dog biscuits in it. And so she will be ready to accept them. This clearly means that I have a relatively intelligent being living with me. And that, that relatively intent, intelligent being has, has got uh, some kind of consciousness. Now there's the dog. <laughs> So I was at least partially consciousness, conscious. And when, my, and when the paramedics came, because, my, because in this stage, my, my son came home and found his, uh, my daughter-in-law came home and found the telephone message that I'd left which said, help, I'm having a stroke. Uh, and she called the ambulance and so forth and they came and I was fully aware of being put on a gurney and taken into the ambulance and taken uh, to the hospital, which is about uh, 15 minutes drive away by ambulance, maybe 20 minutes, and, uh, and, and arriving inside the emergency room of, of the hospital in Kitchener, Ontario. It's clear that I wasn't fully conscious because I still couldn't, I still couldn't 
um, s couldn't identify my left foot. I couldn't identify my left arm. I didn't know. No. I discovered later that I could reach around and find it with my right arm and move it about. But uh, it wasn't there. So I wasn't fully conscious. And moreover, I wasn't fully conscious of my surroundings. Because when I was given a test by the neurologist who came, I was very lucky because the chief stroke neurologist of the, of the area was, happened to be in the hospital. Uh, he gave me a vision test. And the vision test in, was a very simple one. It said, would you look at this picture and describe what's on it? And he told me afterwards, you only described half of the picture. Because I, I only this, I'm sure the neurologists here will know that this is the kind of, um, I know that there's at least one neurologist at, at this con conference, will know that, that you, lose, you lose vision when, uh, when you have a, a stroke. And of course, I had lost half of my field of vision. And so I could not, could not be said to be fully conscious. Because you can't, under the definition I'm talking about, be fully aware if you can't see where, what you've got. So just imagine looking out here, and you can only see the right-hand side of the audience. So I couldn't see those words, duty, beauty, and, and humility, but I could see justice and temperance, for example. And uh, so I, clearly I wasn't conscious, and that tells me, fully conscious, it tells me that, that the state of the brain involved is one which says whether or not one is fully conscious. But at the same time, during this experiment, this is an experiment on myself, I could reason. I think maybe I should try the next slide. But I could reason. The analytical qualities of my brain seem to remain functional. I was offered by the neurologist, I was offered the, the these uh, new drugs, relatively new drugs, these thrombolytic drugs, otherwise known as, as clot busters. Uh, and uh, being a mathematician, I asked about the probabilities of what would happen if I took the drugs. And I was told, well, there's a, there is a, um, a certain probability, I can't remember the exact ones, of complete and total and immediate recovery from this stroke if you take the drug because the, the, uh, the clot will be, will be dissolved, that the clot that's stopping your operation of your brain cells will be dissolved and everything will, will go away. And there's a certain probability of that and I think my recollection is it was about 15%. And then there's a, a, another probability which is approximately 10% that as soon as you take the drug, this is before I had CAT scans and so forth. Uh, your, the clot will be the clot in your in your blood will be dissolved, and it will open up the uh, path for the blood that is that is uh, going to come out of the of the ruptured artery to flood your brain, and you will promptly die. And so I have 15% probability of total recovery, and 10% probability of total death. And the question is. Would you rather, by the way, the 10% probability of death is considerably higher than the probability of being run over by a bus and killed uh, when you walk across the street in uh, Agra. <laughs> so, and the rest of the probability, about, about 75%, was nothing would happen at all. So I said, well, the 75% probability of nothing happening, and uh, and, seven, and so if, if I don't ever recover, I'll be in the same position. Three quarters of the time, I'm going to be in the same position. So I declined the drugs. And I had explained that to my son and my daughter, both of whom had arrived by this time. And uh, because I said, OK, there's the situation. What do you think? I said to my son. And he said, it's your call, Dad. And so uh, even though I was lying in the emergency room with the attendant uh, neurologist there, it, I was able to evaluate whether or not uh, I was going to live or die if I made some sort of probabilities of this, if I made the decision. And so I was sufficiently conscious, you might say, to make life and death decisions even though I was not completely aware of my surroundings. So the, the state, one has to say that the state of consciousness is dependent on how you want to apply it. Right. 
I, and it also is clearly a, a statement of how the brain is working. Now, um, keep trying this one. Ah, it works. So this is what I say. Consciousness is a result of the appropriate parts of the brain and suitable connections of the brain being fully functioned. Just what's appropriate depends, in my view, on, on the circumstances. Uh, and it depends on various other things. And I am not good, since I'm not an expert on such things, I just leave it to experts. And the, I think that the neurologists and the, and the anesthesiologists here should get together and decide what they really mean by appropriateness of brain connections and brain activity for consciousness. Um, now, I'm talking about what I call day-to-day -day consciousness because there's in the clearly higher levels of consciousness. Um, and I think that the most revered Dr. Satsangi is the person who initially talked to me about this. And it can, higher levels of consciousness to me mean enhanced operation of the, of the interactions in one's brain. And how would one do that? Well, and this is the only slide I have with respect to spiritual consciousness, because again, it's not one of the things that I pretend to have any real knowledge of, although at SpearCon, when was SpearCon? 2009 or it's or it's Spossis. maybe that was 2007 At, I I put forward the idea that one can attain spiritual consciousness by by other means than meditation for instance I said and I still believe that that one can attain the, the total feeling of awe through experience. If you suddenly come out of the jungle and you're confronted by the, by the sight of the Zambezi River flowing over what's now known as Victoria Falls, it is a completely awe-inspiring sight. And your mind will be taken in the same sort of direction of spiritual uplifting that it would if you were practicing yogic meditation. If you go in, and this can be done in all sorts of ways. It can also be done through sound. If you are, if you walk into, as I did in Lausanne, uh, into a, a, a cathedral it was, Christian cathedral, a Roman Catholic cathedral in Lausanne. And there was a choir singing a, uh, singing a Handel oratorio. And it was absolutely awe-inspiring. Suddenly in that surrounding, my mind was lifted into a different plane. One can do this in all sorts of ways. One can observe a monarch butterfly coming out of its chrysalis, since, we, since Jack talked about monarch butterflies, or any and see the, the way n nature works and have your mind completely changed. And so in addition then to meditation, um, I think there are other ways of reaching, um, reaching levels of spiritual consciousness. And when one does, um, I think it helps in reaching indeed the ideal of the Raju Swami faith, namely the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. But I have to leave that to other people here because I'm not an expert on spiritual consciousness. Now, I want to speak briefly about the Los Amigos levels of cognitive function, the LOCF scale, which uh, comes out of California because I'm going to give you another example. Um, there are eight levels ranging from unresponsive coma to completely functional level, which is level one through to level eight. Again, I'm not a, an expert on this,
but uh, that doesn't matter. I can still talk about it. There's something about being a, a professor. Uh, I can go on talking for the next two hours if you really want me to, because even though I may not know anything about my subject, because I'm used to giving three-hour lectures. And uh, I used to give three-hour lectures on system theory. And I can do it if you really want me to, but I'm going to try and keep it short. All right? Now, level one, unresp unresponsive coma, the total vegetative state. Now, uh, since this, this, uh, this LOCF scale was initiated, people have been doing all sorts of interesting things with uh, FM, fMRIs. And it is now known that one can communicate with people in what were thought to be un a vegetative state. Uh, and uh, th these have been quite, quite widely reported recently. And I know that, that one of the um, uh, participants in this, con in this uh, conference was on the team that started to do the, uh, the um, communication with a patient who was apparently thought to be completely unresponsive, by, and it could get him to activate parts of his brain in response to questions being asked. And so uh, he was told before the fMRI experience, when you do this, just think about something that was a really wonderful experience for you. And he went through the machine, and one part of his brain if, uh, was activated. And the idea was, he asked this question, if you are feeling pain, activate this part of, um, think of something of one kind, and if you are not feeling pain, think of something of another. And those two things activated different parts of his brain. So when he was asked, are you feeling pain? This is a person who had not responded in any way. Right? He activated the part of his brain which was asked for for, for a, a good um, a good experience. And when he was asked some other question where the answer was no, he activated the other part, part of, the, uh, of the brain. And the, this, of course, was a, a repeatable experiment and was repeated. And so it was clear that you can, in fact, in some cases, actually communicate with people in, a, in, a, in, a veg, in what is apparently a vegetative state. And so those people must, of themselves, have some form of consciousness. Now I'm going to talk about an, another, um, uh, another, another case. Um, this is Lydia Hurley. Lydia Hurley is a young girl. She's about 13. She may be 14 now. Last May, she was coming home from school. And she got out of the school bus. And the, the way school buses work in, in Canada and parts of North America, uh, they ha they're great big yellow things. They go along the road. When they stop, they have a whole lot of red flashing lights, and signs come out the sides of them, and all traffic in every direction is supposed to stop so that the school children can get out and cross the road without being run over in any direction. And this young girl got out of the bus. It was so stopped. And somebody or other who was driving a, a garbage truck. Do I say garbage truck? I'm not quite sure whether you use the word truck or lorry for these things in this country. So it was a very large vehicle. And, um, and it was heavy. And it came beside the bus, not stopping, right past the door. And as she stepped out, the truck came by and hit her and threw her along the road in some, for some considerable distance. And she suffered. Uh, a complete, well, she suffered uh, brain injuries and bone injuries, and she was unable. She couldn't have been able to walk anyway, uh, and she entered into a coma, a complete loss of consciousness. That's a picture of her before she had her accident. And uh, so what happened to Lydia? Well, she's been on a path to recovery. She began at level one, which is the unresponsive coma, and, and she gradually, it was in May that it happened, uh, by level, by August she was in level four on the LOCF scale. She could 
gesture. She could smile. She didn't have to, I'm not quite sure whether she was still fed by tubes, but she didn't understand everything around her. And all of a sudden, in September, speech returned to her. So what we're looking at is the pathways in the brain are being recovered. And of course, in young people, the brain is still growing anyway. I'm not sure if they are, it is at age 13. By November, she was able to walk, assisted. And she returned to her home. She was uh, in a hospital in Toronto, and Lydia was, a, she was about 100 kilometers away in hospital. By November, she was able to walk, and she uh, is expected to go back to school. Now, the question I have to ask is, when was she unconscious? When was she partially conscious? And when was she fully conscious? Consciousness, have we got another slide on here? Yes, we do. Here's a picture of the, here we do. This is a picture of the accident scene. There's the, there's the, the garbage truck. There's the bus. And she, the road is on this side. The, I should be, I should use the pointer. Well, I don't see it. Uh, the road is on the right-hand side. This thing here is the police tape, because the, the, the police came. And you can see the open doors of the bus there on the side. And that truck came down this side. The road is on the right-hand side. And it hit her just as she got off the bus. It was quite dramatic for the other children in the bus, because there were some right behind her getting off at the same spot, and they didn't get hit. And here she is. Uh, on the day that she came home, that she's the one in the, she is, she's this one, she is this one. And, uh, and uh, you can see that she's walking, but in fact she was, you don't see the whole of the picture, she is being somewhat held up. But she lived about 300 meters away from the road, and she was being offered a, an electric golf cart to, uh, to go and greet the well-wishers because her case raised an enormous set of feelings in, in the community. And hundreds of people came out to see her come home. And she was offered the golf cart, but she proved that she could walk all the way from the bus, from the vehicle to the, to the house. It was a cold November day, and that's why she's all dressed up in, uh, in, in, um, in winter clothes. And you can see that it wasn't a cold day the day that she, that she was hit by the bus. Um, the, um, this, this simply says, phys physiologically, consciousness is a, is a matter of how the brain is put together and how the connections between brain cells are made. You can talk about dendrites and, and, and all of this stuff, and, but, but from from the point of view of a sort of uh, macroscopic point of view, it's how the brain pathways are put together. I want just very briefly to talk about subconscious things because there are people who suggest that subconsciousness is something inferior to, uh, to, uh, to consciousness. But then, on the other hand, um, there are those who say, well, subconsciously, I understand that this is saying, I am aware, but I am not specifically, my brain is not specifically aiming at being aware. Um, I had, of course, after I had had a stroke, I had to learn to walk again. But once I had come home from the walk, I didn't have to learn how to ride a bicycle again. I knew how to ride a bicycle. Subconscious, it was there in my, in my brain, but it wasn't something that I had to relearn. So I, I can walk. I can, I can do all of these various things. I'm not following my own. Um, I can walk up and down stairs without thinking. I, the bicycle thing. I have some sort of autonomous brain activity which involves consciousness. Right? And, and so that, in itself, is a, 
is in my, something that we don't think about very much. And, I, and there's another little point which came to me, which I, under, which I thought about this morning a little bit, and that is we, we have, of course, uh, hereditary, hereditary character. I have the same shape face as my father to some I know quite well from looking at pictures of him. Um, this is this is hereditary. One wonders why we don't why hereditary heredity doesn't in, include memories. Why are not memories passed from one brain to another? It's a good question because it's part of consciousness. When you're dreaming, you dream you you Items in your brain come to the fore, and they are things to do with previous experiences. Generally speaking, they're to do with previous experiences. But they may also be to do with previous impressions of experiences. For example, I had a dream the other day, with, which I can remember fairly well, and, it, and I saw in my brain the, some items and actions which had absolutely nothing to do with anything I had experienced except by reading a book. When, when you read a book, you, f you, you form images, and they're only, they're only images in your brain, of what the place is like. So if I re read a book about um, the uh, life and times of Shah, of Shah Jahan, for example, pick on him, because I'm, I know that I've never experienced anything to do with him except the Taj. Um, if I read a book about it, and then I have a dream about it, the, the images in the dream are not the images of the words in the book. They're the images of what came into my mind from reading the book. Those are, are things to do with consciousness. If I... And, and, and they are somewhat this sort of subconscious things. They're subconsciously there at all times. And I believe that they're arriving autonomously in the brain. I would like to see people, um, I'd like to see people explaining or, 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 tr or even training or perhaps modifying people's, m modifying it so that we could actually pass our memories on to our children. It would be kind of interesting. It must come from that way. So there is indeed autonomous brain operation. I, I call that semi-consciousness or semi or subconsciousness. There is a variety of, of, uh, of conscious states in the human being. And, uh, and we really still can't tell. Even though we can talk about um, a possible multi-universes and possible multi-big bangs, we really still can't tell these simple little things about consciousness. So, uh, um, I think about reaching spiritual consciousness not only through, through, um, through meditation, but also through searching through previously stored conscious information. I, in conclusion, because I think I'm about time, um, there are interconnected levels of physical consciousness. Consciousness in the, in the form that I'm talking about is in fact controlled by the brain. It's subject to physiological explanation and ultimately to the laws of physics, right down to superstring theory. Spiritual consciousness, I leave to other people, it's more difficult to attain and much more difficult to ca characterize. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Professor Rowe. Some we can take a couple of questions. Yes, I just have two small comments. First is that at the physical plane, where you were asking about the level of consciousness, conscious, subconscious, so on, I think there is a continuum. There are no steps. Then the second comment was that while you don't inherit memories, memory is a private storehouse you do carry memories of the past, remotest, and maybe previous lives, which yes. come down to you. Okay. Well, well 
uh, I have to respond to that. I absolutely agree with you about the continuum. I, it's, it's very easy to sort of break things into various layers. And in fact, lots of people have. We've, I've heard people talking about 84 different steps and, and so forth. The fact of the matter is that I believe that we are dealing with a continuum. Just like um, all those people who talk about stream of consciousness, it's not, while it must be quantum, quantized in some way or another, but only at a very fine level, we deal with continua. Now, I don't have the, res the capability of responding to your second com comment. Uh, uh, Professor Ro, the one thing that comes to mind is that even in a state of coma, when apparently there is no external physical action, the consciousness is still there. And as I perceive it, consciousness is that element or that thing which suspends the normal second law of thermodynamics. As long as consciousness remains in the body of any living being, the uh, second law is is suspended, that is to say the decay doesn't take place. And the moment that consciousness leaves the body, the law takes over. So it is, I personally feel that even in a state of complete coma or vegetation, as long as the person is alive, consciousness is still there, it may not be manifesting itself. What's your comment? Well. The second law of thermodynamics teaches us that, of course, um, entropy is always increasing in the universe. That's, it comes from there, eventually. But, of course, you can have localized decreases of energy, of entropy. And, and so you talk about um, available energy, for example. Um, and so I don't think you're suspending the second law of thermodynamics. And the second point you made was, I, I can't remember the second point you made. In a state of complete coma. Oh, okay, yes. All right. Thank you. In, in a state of complete coma, we, we, we already know that the brain does not shut down. So consciousness can't possibly completely shut down. Is that the best answer I can give you? Thank you.